Okay, this is the last lecture from me. Uh, congratulations in enduring these uh, CMB lectures. Now you know everything about temperature power spectrum. Today you learn everything about polarization, okay? By the way, now uh, were you able to figure out uh, how to explain features in the power spectrum in words <laughs> without equations? If you haven't, uh, it will be a good exercise. All right, so we're talking about polarization. This is the uh, recap for the Stokes parameters that we ca use to characterize polarization, because polarization has directions. For my own coordinate system of x and y that I arbitrarily pick, then uh, we have this uh, Q, which is perpendicular or parallel to the x-axis, and U, that's 45 degree tilted, right? However, uh, this depends on coordinate system. If you rotate the coordinates, then Q can be transformed to U and vice versa. And uh, that's not good. And uh, now we're going to use this uh, uh, complex quantity, Q plus, plus minus IU, to characterize polarization. That's just a pure mathematical convenience. And uh, now, as I said yesterday already, Q and U are great, these are observables, you can measure them at each point in sky, but they depend on coordinates. Therefore, it really is a nightmare. For example, the definition of Q and U are different between CMB physicists and uh, astronomical standard. So International Astronomical Union has been screaming that the you know, CMB guys, you're idiots, you're using uh, a different convention. <laughs> so, but it's too late for us to change it. But don't worry, because uh, we're going to get something that's coordinate independent, okay? So let's, in order to do this, uh, let's do the flat, flat sky approximation again. So don't deal with spherical harmonics. We can certainly do it, but uh, it doesn't really give you much physical insight. So let's do the uh, flat sky approximation, and then do everything in Fourier transform. So we take the uh, line of sight to be Zenus in whatever coordinates, then uh, make the... Uh, approximation that we're only looking at vicinity of the zenith, and uh, we approximate a, a sphere near that zenith as a flat sky. And then let's do the Fourier transform of the Q and U. Just we did, just like we did for the temperature. That's fine, right? We can always do that. However, because Q plus minus IU change under coordinate transformation, um, AL, AL also picks up this annoying factor of e to the uh, minus plus 2i phi. So let me then rewrite this coefficient as some other coefficient times this exponential. And now phi sub L is the angle that wave vector makes with respect to the x-axis. Okay? That's why we have this uh, subscript L here. This is not the same as phi in the real space, but this is uh, L space. If you do that, then of course, if you change, if you transform the coordinate, rotate the coordinate by phi, this angle that the wave vector makes with respect to x axis also gets transformed. Such a way that Transformation in left-hand side will be canceled by the transformation on the right-hand side, yeah? Making this invariant. This does not pick up the factor of phi when we rotate the coordinate, yeah? Just trick. So this will be my new coefficients. That's my new transformation. Then, just for convenience, let's write this plus minus 2AL as EL plus minus IBL, so that the left hand side and right hand side look similar. And we're done. This E and B do not depend on coordinate rotation. Okay? So now, now we're all friends. I don't get shouted, you know, you're wrong, I measured you. You don't measure Q, whatever. So that, that's perfect. So what do they represent? 
let's expand the uh, uh, exponential and uh, try to compute Q and U separately, not, not just Q plus minus IU. That's what I get, okay? And then I'm going to take uh, one single Fourier mode and take the direction of L to be the direction of X axis. So, uh, sine phi two phi L will be zero because phi will be zero now. Sine two phi zero, hence Q is now E times the exponential, uh, for, uh, the plane wave, Q is now B times plane wave. That's the pattern. E mode would be parallel or perpendicular to wave vector direction. B would be 45 degree tilted with respect to wave vector direction. This is a coordinate independent statement. Okay? You rotate coordinate, L gets rotated, but the fact that the U are parallel to or perpendicular to L vector would not change. Another way of thinking about, okay, that why I said that E mode will be parallel or perpendicular to a vector, B mode will be 45 degree tilted. Another way of thinking about it, if you don't like this, another way of thinking about it is that you take, you say, uh, e mode is a Stokes Q defined with respect to L vector as the X axis. Okay? Because I can define Q and U in whatever coordinates I want to define. But once you say, okay, I take the L vector as my reference point that I define Stokes parameters, and E will be Q with respect to L, B will be U with respect to L. You know, these two definitions, of course, equivalent, and you can take which one, whichever you like. These are, again, coordinate in the independent statements. Let's talk about parity. So you look this into the mirror, then E does not change, but B flips sign. Okay? So this property is very useful when you try to make measurements. This gives you unambiguous decomposition of the sky into B and E. And then we can take the power spectrum. Power spectrum of E, power spectrum of B, and cross power spectrum of T and E. And cross power spectrum of E and B, and cross power spectrum of T and B as well. But when, if the universe conserves parity, which it doesn't have to, weak interactions do not conserve parity, so why, why should they? But if they do, then E, B, and T, B vanish. Why? Because you're talking about taking a correlation, let's say this is E mode, this is B mode, okay? Now you change parity, then you flip this, okay? And uh, so they, they change sign, because B change signs. So EB changes sign under parity flip. But if parity is conserved, these quantities should be equal. So this must vanish. But in a parity non-conserved universe, EB and TB, in fact, do not vanish. Okay? So that's, that's, a, that's a clean window into new physics. So far, it hasn't been found, but it could be found in the future. All right, so this is the power spectrum E mode, and this is the power spectrum B mode, and we're going to study these today. I'm not going to talk about B mode from lensing. This will be the, uh, essentially, when you have E modes that get converted into B mode, you see the broader feature are very similar here by gravitational lensing. Fantastic subject. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, okay? All right. So single most important thing you have to remember for today is a polarization generated by local quadrupole temperature anisotropy. I hope you remember this from the yesterday's lecture. And quadrupole temperature anisotropy is proportional to viscosity, local viscosity. Yes? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, so good. So uh, wh why is there any non-zero value here, right? Yeah, the, uh, you're talking about this one, or? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so uh, viscosity is gradually rising. 
right? I mean, as as universe becomes more transparent and transparent, viscosity is gradually rising. So even at uh, lower multiples, you still get non-zero value. But this is basically a proportion of L square. So it's almost like white noise, essentially, in terms of polarization. So you don't get abrupt cutoff here, because viscosity is gradually rising. Yeah. All right, so from the point of view of an electron at the lots of scattering surface, this will be the temperature quadrupoles that the electron would see. M equals zero, M equals one, M equals two, okay? Let's graphically symbolize this as this, okay? So you, electron is middle, in the middle. It sees hot above, hot down, cold in horizon, okay? And if you see the scattered light by electron, the light is coming toward you, polarization will be horizontal. Because it's coming, hot is coming this way, stuck scattered will give you the uh, longer line. Cold will be scattered, but it will give you vertical, but the shorter line. So as a result, you get this uh, horizontal polarization, okay? Then you take a plane wave, say gravitational potential or sound waves, that goes to the Z direction. And each point, the you know, crests and troughs, the sign of the uh, quadru local quadrupole will change, okay? So these are the uh, viscosity at each point in space, as seen from an electron, okay? Now, if observer is here looking into this, and it sees polarization that looks like that, because it's hot, horizon is hot, and uh, cold above, 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 above and bottom. It takes time to use, get used to this. Okay. Is this clear? You have, you have cold, cold, and hot, hot here. I see this, right? Now, you have to imagine, okay? This thing, this funny four balls, move, no, the horizon is clear, move above, rises, okay? And I see still not quite perfect hot, cold, hot, cold, I see this a bit tilted, right? But I still see it's kind of hot, cold, hot, cold, yeah? But polarization will be reduced because you don't see perfect polarization, the quadrupole there from point of view of electron, yeah? But then when this thing goes to the zenith, you no longer see any quadrupole. It's actually hot or cold, surrounded by hot or cold, right? So it's not gonna be, I don't see quadrupolar pattern there. Therefore, I don't see any polarization, okay? And but as you can see, this is E mode. And I hope you understand that this is the only thing you get. There will be no B mode coming from sound waves. There is no way, right, when this, the sound waves propagate in the Z direction, you can create something tilted. And uh, another important thing I want to say, this is azimuthary, azimuthary symmetric. In other words, it doesn't matter whether I take X to the east or west or whatever. Right? I get exactly the same pattern, independent of azimuthal angle. Right. If that's so, then you should never generate 45 degree tilt polarization with respect to Z direction. Yeah? What that means is that sound waves never generate B, only E. And this is a very special property of the scalar type perturbation. E mode. E mode, so local uh, viscosity is generated by local velocity gradient through the mechanics, land down lift sheets, okay? Because velocity potential is sine. Now we learned this from Doppler effect. 
Velocity potential is the de time derivative of the density. Density is cosine, predominantly for adiabatic perturbation. Hence, velocity is sine. So, E mode polarization is actually sine squared, as opposed to the power spectrum of the te uh, temperature that's predominantly cosine squared. That's it, right? That's doubling up nine here. Planck has done a fantastic job. You can also, and here, the higher multiples are noisy. Uh, Planck runs out of sensitivity there because the uh, Planck's uh, mirror is 1.5 meter. And uh, if you wanted to sample the uh, higher multiples, you need to have the better angular resolution. You can't really launch bigger mirror in space. It's too expensive, too heavy. But if you do the measurements from the ground, you can build, let's say, 10 meter telescope, and that's, you can get very nicely the small scale modes. But because it's from the ground, you cannot cover full sky. Therefore, on lower multiples, Planck does a much better job. Yeah, this is only, I think, uh, 500 square degrees. This is full sky. So, so your error was bigger here, but your error was much better here. Okay? Fantastic measurements. Now, let me impress you. Um, it is true that uh, whenever I give talks on CMB and say we've determined six parameters, okay, people get uncomfortable because, oh, there's so many parameters, I can fit anything. In fact, uh, von Neumann said, uh, with two parameters, I can fit an elephant, and with three parameters, I can make an elephant move. So, uh, indeed, yeah, sure. Here, this dashed line is fit only to power, temperature power spectrum. And you make a measurement of E mode power spectrum, then, bingo, right? Curve goes right through the E mode power spectrum. But this is not the fit. Parameters are derived only from the temperature power spectrum. This is an amazing test of the standard cosmological model. Yeah? So I just wanted to want you to know that. <laughs> because during the discussion session, I think yesterday and uh, two days ago, people were asking, right? Six parameters. You know, we can do anything. Here, there's no cheating here anymore, okay? What you learned works. Right. So this is a, a beautiful example of a, a triumph of the standard cosmological model. So uh, because power spectrum of the temperature is cosine square and the E mode is sine square, the uh, troughing T will be peaking E. And T dumps and E rises because the, uh, it's due to viscosity. And power spectrum of E is actually sharper. Because temperature power spectrum receives contribution from both Doppler, which is sine square, and density, that's cosine square. If you add them, peaks get a bit smeared out, where right? they're not very sharp. But E mode power spectrum is only sine squared. There's no cosine square contribution. So peaks are, in fact, sharper. Yeah? This means that uh, if you can make very precise measurement of E mode power spectrum, cosmological constraints can be quite tight. Even, could be even better than the temperature power spectrum. They are very sensitive to uh, sound waves. What about that? So uh, we tr learned about uh, optical depths uh, uh, due to reionization. Now let's talk about temperature. So temperature, the photons are coming toward you from the last source scattering surface, and some of them are rescattered by the free electrons in a lower redshift due to reionization. So they are scattered away, hence the temperature power spectrum damps by e to the minus two tau. But of course, some other photons that wanted to go other direction, wanted to go to other observers, are now scattered into our line of sight. These photons are now polarized due to the scattering, okay? So that's that, that bump here. Because these scatterings happen in a relatively late time, redshift less than 10, I would say. They appear in a very large scales. And uh, the amplitude of that is proportional to tau square 
times the uh, scalar amplitude A, AS. Now let's fix, however, the uh, high multiples, which are well measured. So as I said, this part is proportional to AS times eta minus two tau. If I fix that, then low multiple power spectrum would, be, would scale like AS tau squared, but now fix AS, e to the minus two tau. So this will scale like tau squared times e to the plus two tau. If tau is small, the lower the power spectrum scales like tau squared uh, times one plus two tau. So that's how you can use this measurement to constrain optical depth. Unfortunately, we don't yet have precise measurements of it. 0.089 was the final value from WM9 year. 0.066 was the uh, 2015 release of the Planck. 0.055 is the latest intermediate release from Planck. And uh, no one knows what's going to come out uh, in uh, July. Maybe even Planck team doesn't know. <laughs> There's no consensus. I'm not part of Planck. Uh, but maybe 0.05, but I don't believe that value. So eventually, uh, we need to launch uh, future satellite missions, such as Lightbird that I was uh, talking to you about uh, yesterday, discussion session. Uh, maybe we need something like that to uh, fix tau, yes. What is the shape of this? This? This is a sound wave. Sign. This. This is the shape. Rises and dumps. Yeah, okay. Yes? Because they are closer. Yeah. <laughs> so they subtend larger angle. Yeah. All right, now let's cross correlate because the E mode pass, but E mode, a scalar E mode is produced by temperature. Temperature and E mode will be correlated. Okay? So let's take a correlation. Velocity is sine, and uh, temperature is produced from the cosine. So T correlation will be now sine times cosine, which can change sine signature. <laughs> sine times cosine changes signs. Yeah. yeah, oscillates, that's W map. Planck, beautiful. Huh? SPT, now we now map out all this stuff here. Very beautiful. Once again, this line is not a fit. OK? <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's uh, take a closer look at the physics. <clears throat> temperature, at least on large scales, is a gravitational potential, okay? Polarization is a velocity. Of course, plasma falls into the potential. So TE correlation actually tells you how plasma is moving at the lots of scattering surface, okay? So this uh, viscosity, which is the second derivative of the uh, viscosity potential pi, is a velocity divergence. So sign of this uh, E mode power spectrum is basically determined by whether <coughs> velocity is diverging or converging. All right, so let's look at it. Gravitational potential, and stuff is falling into the gravitational potential well, right? but uh, the plasma is flowing, flowing out of the gravitational potential hill. Okay? So depending upon whether the velocity is converging or diverging, you get different signs of local temperature quadrupole. Yeah? So that's the polarization pattern. Here, at the bottom of the potential well, Temperature is cold, right? The temperature you observe is cold. So the electron at the bottom of the potential well will see hot electron coming from uh, that direction. That's why you see hot, hot here from the point of electron and cold, cold there. And that will give you this polarization pattern. Yes? All right. 
Now let's look at the T correlation, not in the Fourier space, but in the uh, angular scale, angular space, because that is more intuitive. Okay, so let's place and let's define uh, Stokes parameter in a different way now, right? Stokes parameters change uh, depending on how you define them. Instead of defining uh, Stokes parameter with respect to x and y, now I'm going to define Stokes parameter with respect to theta and phi. Okay. So this is still Zenith, and I define uh, Q polarization to be parallel or perpendicular to polar angle direction here. So previously, this was negative Q, this was positive Q. Now, according to the new definition, all of these are negative Q. Okay? Now I place temperature to be here, and correlate that with the polarization as a function of theta. Why do I want to do that? Because in this way, I can average over azimuthal angle to get statistics. So if you want, that will be a spherical radial profile of polarization as a function of theta from the, uh, of the, from the temperature at the origin. Once again, if Q is negative, it's the... Uh, this, uh, what is called, uh, azimuthal, azimuthal pattern, okay? And if Q is positive, it will be radial pattern. So, let's, let's try to understand what, what's going on here. This will be the uh, angular space temperature Q polarization correlation function. Temperature is at zero spacing, here's the origin. So this tells you how Q will change uh, as a function of the angle from the beginning, uh, from the origin. On very large scales, temperature, and let's look at uh, gravitational potential well, okay? So at the center, there's a gravitational potential well, okay? From the plasma point of view, temperature at the origin is negative because it's gravitational potential well. TQ, correlation function, is negative here, which means Q is positive here because T is negative. Q is positive, so it's radial. How do I understand that? Go back here. Gravitational potential well, stuff is flowing in, then polarization direction is radial, yeah? So we're observing that the stuff is flowing in here, okay? Now, um, now what? I have to remember myself. <laughs> stuff is flowing in now, okay? And, um, Yes. Now, stuff flows in, flowing in, flowing in, and you're getting closer to the um, gravitational potential well. But now, because of this uh, sound wave, it, it, it compresses the gas, and the temperature at the origin now increases. From the uh, uh, very distant point of view, the gravitational potential is big, it's cold spot. But because the, uh, as the gas compresses inside the gravitational potential, well, temperature rises. And for the adiabatic initial condition, eventually the temperature reverses the sign. So now gravitational potential well will be the positive, positive temperature as you go closer to the gravitational potential well. So Q changes sign, as, uh, TQ changes sign because T changes sign, but Q is still, uh, yeah, Q is still radial, okay? Now, you now get beginning to get into the gravitational potential well. Then, near the gravitational potential well, bottom, the uh, Q changes the sign, right? So you get negative Q and TQ. So here, radial, tangential. And now you go to the, really the bottom of the potential well, and plasma encounters hot photons. Now they are pushed back 
by the pressure. They cannot fall into the gravitational potential anymore. So plasma flows out. Reverse is a sign of quadrupole because it's velocity divergence and changes sign. Then, so it's radial again. Now as you go to very, very bottom of the potential, it's zero because for the symmetry reason, polarization cannot have the zero, uh, non-zero value at the origin. Okay, they all cross like this and there'll be no polarization. Okay? It's complicated. As you could see, me struggling also, <laughs> despite the fact that uh, I proposed this myself. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, ta -da, this is the measurement. Uh, so this is, simulation. this is data, this is simulation. So we've done this for W map, and the Planck did that beautifully also. Radial, tangential, and radial. Plasma is flowing in, yeah? So this is very nice. So this is the uh, uh, stacked profile of the polarization around a uh, temperature hotspot, okay? So this is very nice. We see that in the real data. So there's no new information here <coughs> compared to the T power spectrum, but nonetheless, this you know, gives you sort of clear idea what the T is actually measuring. You know, plasma is falling in, and that's what you're measuring here. Let's talk about gravitational waves now. Any questions about sound wave part? So we're done with the E-mode polarization from sound waves. Q, good. So Q negative will be the radial, uh, uh, the, not the radial, the tangential. This is Q. This is Q negative. Tangential. Yeah. So tangential means, uh, ah. yeah. Th this, this is the origin, yeah. and then uh, azimuthal <laughs> or tangential. <laughs> yeah. This is the pattern for Q negative. <laughs> this, yeah, and the Q neg Q positive would be radial. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about gravitational waves. Gravitational waves stretch space in an anisotropic way. Yeah, so how do you measure this? You already uh, heard from Professor Babak about how it works, so, but let's remind ourselves, laser interferometer. LIGO, you can use a locally inertial frame, so you can interpolate LIGO results as changing the distance between mirrors, mirror and beam splitter. Gravitational waves stretch space and mirror distances change, and you get a signal, right? That's beautiful. But, uh, you know, you can do this on, the, on Earth, or you can use this using satellite orbiting around the Earth. Wavelengths that you can measure is like a, for LIGO, it's 1,000 kilometers, or a million kilometers for LISA, but uh, you can't really do this for. Gravitational waves affecting CMB because wavelengths of the uh, gravitational wave that's affecting CMB is billion light years. Okay, so you're not gonna get laser interferometers or even pulsar timing array uh, as long as billions of light years. You cannot, you just cannot do that. So how do we do it? We use universe as a laboratory, universe as a detector. So let's say you have isotropic electromagnetic waves. Uh, and then let gravitational wave propagate. So they're coming toward you. That's the z direction. The x, y direction is on the screen now, and they are stretching like that, plus and cross modes. You already learned that from Professor Babak's great lectures. Now, because space is stretched, wavelengths of light is stretched too. Okay. Thanks to this Zach Swarf formula, or well, you heard exactly the same thing from, from Professor Babak's lecture. So now, you don't need velocity gradients to produce local temperature quadrupole around an electron. Just having gravitational waves pass by, they automatically generate temperature quadrupole around an electron. That will then produce polarization. But before we Talk about polarization from gravitational waves. Let's talk about temperature anisotropies. That's this. Yeah, this is essentially integrated Zaxworth effect from tensor modes. 
tensor integrate Zaxx Wolf effect will produce polarization, the uh, temperature and isotropy is in, in CMB. Now, <coughs> so tensor viscosity is automatically generated by gravitational waves. Let's assume tight coupling between photons and baryons. So now gravitational waves constantly generate temperature and isotropies as they propagate, but any temperature and isotropies generated before the last scattering will be wiped away because we cannot see them. Yeah? So any temperature and isotropy is generated, the any temperature and isotropy that survives scattering uh, will be generated after the decoupling. So we truncate this uh, integral uh, at the lasso scattering surface and we integrate only from lasso scattering surface to present time. So as gravitational waves propagate from lasso scattering surface to us, they, constant, they continuously generate temperature and isotropies. Okay? This is the equation motion for gravitational waves. You've seen it already. Uh, in the Professor Bauer's lecture. That's the uh, metric tensor, and then it gets redshifted due to cosmological expansion. You also have this uh, right hand side that's the uh, uh, stress energy tensor over the tensor perturbations. This can do two things. One needs to, of course, generate gravitational waves if you had a sources. Or it can also damp, actually, gravitational waves. Due if, if you have a neutrino and isotopic stress here, they actually damp gravitational waves. Uh, so this needs to be taken into account. For cosmology, we typically ignore this uh, generation of gravitational waves by the sources, and we say, during inflation, the vacuum fluctuations, the quantum fluctuations uh, of this will be the source of gravitational waves we see today in, uh, in the billions of light years. So let me repeat, you wanna hear this uh, next week from Professor Kleban. So let's ignore this here, right hand side, okay? It's a vacuum. So how do you ever get gravitational waves? This is a wave equation. Whenever you have a wave equation, you can quantize it, okay? You quantize it, then you realize that uh, gravitational waves can be quantum mechanically generated. This is the quantum gravity Gravitational metric perturbation, <laughs> not quantum gravity, because quantum gravity is a quantization of the background of space time. We're not doing that. We're far from it. <laughs> but perturbations can be quantized. That's a great stepping stone, no? however. So if we can detect this thing, we're excited to say, oh, this is the first time that we've, we've found quantum nature of space time perturbations. <laughs> Not the background, but that's a great state. However, don't forget, there can be sources during inflation too, and they can generate gravitational waves as well. So if you quantize this, and vacuum fluctuation, the metric perturbations, there can be its scale invariant, Gaussian, and they don't distinguish between left-handed, right-handed polarization and gravitational waves because vacuum doesn't care, it's right or left. If, can, if it was, on the other hand, if it was generated by matter at field during inflation, it can be completely non-scale invariant, completely non-Gaussian, and completely chiral. So you can generate only R or L. So this is a great way to distinguish between the contributions from vacuum and contributions from matter fields. Okay? So uh, that would be nice. So that would be the source of gravitational waves we're talking about here. For the sake of simplicity, let me ignore these matter contributions and only talk about, uh, only use vacuum contribution, which is scale invariant. Now, if you take the super horizon solution, so ignore the spatial relative here, the uh, solution is very simple. This metric perturbation actually stays constant. It's a, so again, it's conserved. Just like zeta for scalar perturbation, this is a conserved quantity. Okay, if you ignore the decaying term which means there will be no ISW effect, temperature and isotropy on super horizon scales. Gravitational waves do not do anything to temperature and isotropy un until they enter the horizon. Now, because it doesn't oscillate, right, it's constant, it doesn't actually look like gravitational waves, does it? Yeah? 
So it would be, it'd be sort of better to call this tensor perturbations uh, because gravita these are not really gravitational waves. It's not a wave. It's constant. But as soon as they enter the horizon, they behave like gravitational waves. And in fact, solution during the matter era is a better function. It's oscillatory function. Eta here is so-called conformal time, or a more sort of uh, intuitive way to understand it, it will be the distance that's photon traveled from the time zero to, to time t. So it's oscillating. And the amplitude of metric perturbation decays as one over a due to the cosmological expansion. What's relevant for temperature and isotropy is the time derivative of that. So that actually decays as one over a square. Now, the uh, stress energy tensor of gravitational waves, well, energy density in gravitational wave is actually given by time derivative squared. Yeah? So that decays as one over a to the four. That sounds familiar because gravitational waves are radiation. These are massless particles. Therefore, they should behave like a radiation, and the radiation energy density goes like one over to the four. Indeed, it satisfies that. So it's very nice, yeah? Okay, so this is the temperature power spectrum from gravitational waves. It's more or less constant here, and that's because of the fact that uh, gravitational waves, I'm assuming here, is scale invariant. But then, it, it dumps here. What's going on here, okay? So this is just the, uh, the fact that tensor modes uh, before decoupling wouldn't give you any temperature anisotropies. So here is what happens. If, the, if there was no scattering between electrons and photons erasing temperature anisotropies, this would stay, this would stay continue, continuously uh, flat, scale invariant, okay? Now, imagine that before decoupling, Tensor nodes came inside the horizon. They produce ISW. But that's washed out because of the tight coupling between electrons and temperature. Then tensor nodes decay, okay? One over A. So here's a mode here that enters the horizon before decoupling. Decays, decay, 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 decay. This will be the magnitude of tensor perturbation at last of scattering surface. Now, finally, they can produce temperature and isotropy. Here, enter the horizon before decoupling, decay, 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 decay. If they are, at the decoupling, finally, they are allowed to produce temperature, temperature and isotropy. Okay? This is not silk damping, because there's no sound wave. This is simply the fact that, so it's not exponential, right? Silk damping is exponential. This is much, much slower, it is the minus three. So here, once again, temperature and isotropy enter the horizon before decoupling, decay, 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 decay. Here, finally, they're allowed to produce polarization. Uh, sorry, temperature and isotropy. Here, same thing. But here, there are less time for them to decay. It's closer to decoupling epoch, right? So therefore, correspondingly, the temperature and isotropy here is bigger. The fact that it oscillates like that, so this is not sound wave, okay? The phase of this is not uh, de determined by sound sound velocity, it's actually determined by photon velocity, speed of light. It's oscillates because the uh, gravitational wave enter the horizon, decay, decay, decay while oscillating, and end up having a phase here, like this one. Next one, decay while oscillating, but uh, it, the oscillation phase is a bit different from this one because the time it took between horizon re-entry and decoupling is different. Does that make sense? Yeah? And now once you enter the horizon after decoupling, you stay producing scale invariant temperature and All right. <clears throat> so they produce polarization, okay? Very nice. Now, let's take uh, propagation direction of gravitational wave to be z direction. And because gravitational waves stretch space only in the horizontal direction, that it's a transverse wave, this time it's m equals two, okay? 
So this will be the part under electron C's at the last source scattering surface. Okay? All right. First of all, let's choose the coordinate such that in the, uh, this direction, as we saw direction, phi equals zero, I'm picking up cross mode. Sorry, plus mode. Plus mode. Plus mode, yeah? Okay. Actually, let, let me actually start with the zenith here. In zenith, I see full quadrupole. Right? Do you see that? So temp the gravitation waves stretch space in horizontal direction. Gravitation waves are propagated in z direction now. It is at zenith that I see now full quadrupole around the electron. Okay? So the polarization will be maximum at zenith. Like that. Now, I take this to the horizon. I still see quadrupole, but not as dramatic as the zenith. So I'm pretty sure the polarization sort of slowly changes. But I still see non-zero uh, quadrupole even at the horizon here. I see cold and hot. So I still see the polarization, but uh, half the amplitude. The polarization on the horizon is half the, of the zenith. Okay? I can do the same thing for cross mode. I just uh, change my line of sight by 45 degrees, and suddenly cross mode does exactly the same thing. Here, Important, azimuth symmetry is broken. For scalar perturbation, we had azimuth symmetry. It didn't matter whether you're looking at phi equals zero, 45 degrees, or 90 degrees, it didn't matter. Here it does, because gravitational waves stretch space in horizontal direction in an isotropic way. Scalar perturbation were well, like that, so it's azimuth symmetric. Tensor perturbations are no longer azimuth symmetric, okay? So it matters whether you're looking at phi equals zero, or 45, or 90 degrees. Indeed, if I now take cross mode and look at phi equals zero, you get this. Now, let's look at the zenith again. I see full quadrupole, but now 45 degree tilted with respect to the previous case. Magnitude is the same, orientation is a bit different. Now I take to the horizon. On the horizon, however, I don't see quadrupole anymore. Right? This quadrupole now is a 45 degree tilted. So from the angle 45 degree, I don't see any quadrupole on the horizon. Do you see that? There's no polarization on the horizon for this case. And look. It's B mode, right? That's how you generate B mode, yeah? Now you can explain. In words, for the first time, <laughs> how tensor mode generate B modes. It's not easy, but now I hope you can see it's easy to actually understand, yes? Yeah, so why do I see, why do I see no polarization on the horizon? Because you, you need to see temperature quadrupole around an electron, okay? On the horizon, I should really create a ball like this, yeah? that would be much easier. So you need to have, in zenith, okay? Hot, hot, cold, cold electron right there in IC polarization, right? Shift this. I see only hot and cold. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, it's not quite a ball. Like like yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, this is, sounds a bit weird because uh, this sounds as if H cross generates V mode, but no, that's not the case. Once again, if you uh, load the coordinate by 45 degrees, now you, now you see that the, also plus mode will do the exactly the same thing. So both plus mode and cross mode generate both E and B. 
Okay? That's important. Because the fact that the cross and plus coexist generating E and B is coordinate independent statement. Okay. I'm just choosing a particular coordinate to explain you better, but uh, of course, the, everything I say here is coordinate independent. No, they produce both E and B. Power spectra. So, uh, scalar modes didn't produce any B, and that's a distinct feature of scalar perturbation. Tensor perturbation produces both E and B, so they are more democratic. Reason why we often hear that uh, detection of B mode is a signature of gravitational waves, right? Is that E mode doesn't produce B. Uh, sorry, uh, scalar mode doesn't produce B. It's not that tensor mode only produces B, okay? It's not the case. Tensor produces both E and B. Yeah? You already saw that. B is a bit less than E. That's simply because for single plane wave to produce a B mode, you actually don't see anything in the horizon. E mode is non zero on the horizon. So this geometric factor, this is one plus cosine square, this is a cosine, 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 just cosine, as a function of the polar angle. That geometric factor can explain why B mode is smaller than B, smaller than E, that's it. On low multiples, this realization contribution Suddenly, B is bigger than E. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't have an intuitive explanation why that's so. Uh, yeah, if you can figure it out, tell me. <laughs> I explained everything for you, except this thing. I cannot explain this. <laughs> All right. Now, what is this damping? This is something also I didn't know uh, until I read a very nice paper by uh, Pritchard and Kamiankowski. I thought initially this was simply due to the fact that tensor perturbations uh, cannot produce uh, te temperature, uh, tensor perturbations cannot produce temperature and sort of is before decoupling. I thought that this was simply due to the fact that uh, temperature power spectrum damps like that. It turns out that this damping is caused by Landau damping. The fact that uh, the uh, last source cutting surface has a finite thickness. Remember, we talked about this for scalar perturbation. You have a silk damping, but that wasn't enough to explain why damping starts at L of 1,000. Silk damping alone will give you L of 1,300. You have to include this Landau damping due to, well, fuzziness of the damping due to the fuzziness of the last source cutting surface to explain fully the damping of scalar waves. Here, there's no silicon damping, but there is Landau damping. In fact, so this is a paper by Pritchard and Kamenkowski. If you didn't have Landau damping, that would be the power spectrum of B mode in E mode. It's constant. Yeah. That's pretty cool. With damping, you can now explain the full feature of the polarization power spectrum. All right. So. Nonetheless, now it's intuitive, right? So uh, at the uh, horizon, at the decoupling, uh, higher L, no, por no temperature anisotropies, lower L is scale invariant, power spectrum of temperature anisotropies, because ISW continuously generates temperature anisotropies. But to get polarization, you need scattering. Okay? That's why you get only polarization at last scattering. And realization, there's nothing in between. Unlike temperature power spectrum. TE correlation, likewise, is non zero at the uh, last of setting surface and realization. So, that's it. You understand why peak locations the way they are, why peak heights are the way they are. Now you know E mode polarization, why it's rising and why it's uh, decaying here, why they're out of phase. Now you know why B mode power spectrum, B mode polarization power spectrum from gravitational waves looks the way they do. This is not sound wave, blah, 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 why it's damping and you know, everything about that. Enjoy.
and being able to explain all the features in words. Right? Thank you very much.